Hello everyone, today I will be doing a review of a lecture done by Dr. Albert Kirky as he talks about acute coronary syndrome and high sensitivity troponins. So let us start with the definition of type 1 MI. So he started with the type 1 MI definition and he reminded us that type 1 MI are the STEMIs and the non-STEMIs that we see. And then you have type 2 MI, which is an imbalance between the demand and the supply of oxygen in the heart, and that is what is called demand ischemia, and that is also known as type 2 myocardial infarction. So typically with a type 1 MI, um, it is the most common cause for troponin elevations. However, there are several other causes that can lead to troponin elevation, as you know. So you could have sepsis. You could have kidney disease or any other type of hypoxic event or respiratory failure. And any type of anemia, any type of severe anemia can lead to elevated troponins. So those are some of the other potential causes of elevated troponins that we would see in a blood test. Heart failure is also a big one. So anemia, hypoxemia, hypotension and septic shock also, we would also see elevated troponin levels. <clears throat> and here is a depiction of the type 1 myocardial infarction. So type 1 MI is usually those STEMIs when the patients have a ruptured plaque with 100% occlusion of the vessel. These are the STEMIs that we have to do the PCIs immediately and take them to the cath lab. And this is an emergent situation. So those are the non-STEMIs also when the patient has 80 to 90% obstruction of the vessel. So this is type 1 MI. Type 2 MI is when you have an imbalance between the demand and the supply of oxygen. And there's a lot of causes that can lead to them. So these are some of them here. You can have a coronary embolism can lead to a type 2 MI. Sustained tachyarrhythmias is like when the patient has a sustained ventricular tachycardia or, or uh, ventricular tachycardic storm that will lead to the demand and ischemia. And consequently, you would have type 2 myocardial infarction. So these are the other causes, most of them that we have already talked about, that would cause an elevation in troponin. However, there have been, has been a trend across the country to move to a better way to diagnose myocardial infarction, and there have been some interventions on trying to find a high sensitivity troponin that will vastly make the diagnosis of uh, acute MI. So the data on that is based on a study that looked at a bunch of patients and with, which had chest pain, and patients were stratified into different levels of troponin. So in our lab here, um, I believe that the positive troponin assay for men is 19 and for women is 11 to 12 on average. So troponin of say 20 means that it is a positive troponin, but it's a very low positive. And these studies were stratified, stratified the troponins at different cutoffs. So you have less than five, five to nine, five to nine, 10 to 14, 15 to 29, 30 to 49 and greater than 50. So there was a very significant correlation with outcomes. So patients who had a troponin of more than 50, that is this line here, they had the worst mortality. So the high sensitivity troponin levels correlated very significantly with bad outcomes. So if your troponin is higher than 50, if your troponin is higher than 50, there's a very high likelihood that the patient will die from an MI. So a lot of this literature is very new and it has arisen from about two years ago. And there's not a lot of consensus on the literature yet, but there is a lot of expert opinions. And there are no true real guidelines or consensus yet. <clears throat> but there was a recent review article that was published in 2018 that gave some instructions and tried to give some recommendations on what to do now with the high sensitivity troponins. So one of the first things that we want to highlight is that 
the ICU nurse can play a major role in, in these tests. So one of the benefits of the high sensitivity troponin is that we can detect a myocardial infarction in um, a lot earlier than before. So because typically we would do the first troponin in the ER and then in the past repeat another one in six hours and then a third one in six hours. But now the recommendation is that with the high sensitivity troponin is that we do one as soon as the patient hits the ER, so at level zero, then we do a repeat one in one hour, then we do another one at the two hour mark, and then we do another one at the three hour mark after the patient has arrived in the ER. So if they all have been negative, all of those troponins have been negative, then we can rule out a myocardial infarction within four hours of that patient coming into the emergency room. So this is one of the benefits of the high sensitivity troponin because within four hours in the emergency room, if the patient has not had a rise in the troponin level or they're all negative, the patient can relatively be safely discharged home. So early diagnosis is one of the benefits of the high sensitivity troponin. So this is most important to highlight because we will still see a lot of patients here getting a troponin in the ER and then the patient comes up to the unit uh, and for 12 hours they haven't had a second troponin completed. So if you have a patient on the floor that came up with only one set of troponins, that should not happen anymore. So if you see that, you need to call the physician right away and ask for another set of troponins right away. So we do not want to wait anymore for six hours for troponins to be done. The high sensitivity troponins should be done every hour up to the four hours. So after four sets of troponins, according to the review article, according to the experts, if all of them have been negative, like we said, the patient can be ruled out from an MI um, and the patient may be safely discharged home. So that patient does not have a myocardial infarction. They may need to be evaluated for other things, but we know they didn't have a myocardial infarction. But we should also look at the delta. The delta means the change. So when we look at the delta, some of the experts say that if it is a rise of about 15 or 20 compared to the prior troponin within an hour apart, then it is highly suggestive of an MI. So someone asked the question, what do we do with patients with a very high troponin level of say 5,000? We never used to see anyone go about 40 or 50 or so. <clears throat> so we can get a rough idea. So on the old troponin assays, a positive troponin was more than 0 0.014 on average. But now a positive troponin is 18, for example, in men. So this is like getting a new number, dividing that new number by 1,000, and it may correlate roughly to what the old troponin numbers used to be. So for example, if you got a troponin of 7,000 and you divide it by 1,000, that number is 7. And so the old troponin was about 7. But you're not supposed to do this because these are different compounds and they're different assays. But when you do this, it really is just giving you an idea of what the old number would look like, a rough idea. Um, so for example, a troponin of 20 on an old assay, an old test, which is very high, would correlate to a troponin today of about 20,000 now. So there have been some algorithms and recommendations on what to do now with the troponin. And this study um, highlights it a little bit. So we have, so what they recommend is that we do the three, um, well, first the zero, and then the one hour, and then at the second hour, and then at the third hour, we do the troponin level. So we do troponin levels one hour apart. And within three hours of that patient being admitted to the emergency room, if the troponins have all been negative, <clears throat> you can safely rule out MI and discharge the patient. If the troponin is, is very positive, <clears throat> if it's very positive, the troponin level, it's an automatic rule in. For example, if the patient hits the ER and has a troponin of say 300 to 400, those are, those are considered very high numbers and those patients automatically rule in, um, even if it's a non-STEMI. And we should not wait six hours apart to do the next troponin. So remember, do troponins every hour. <clears throat> do it every hour apart. 
So this is another flow chart and a flow chart and a diagram to help doctors in the emergency room to know how to deal with these patients. So for example, if you have a patient with active chest pain, you do an EKG as we always do. So now let's suppose that the EKG shows ST elevation. The patient would automatically rule in for myocardial infarction because they had the chest pain and the EKG changes. That meets the criteria for MI. If the patient has chest pain and an EKG, um, and the EKG is sus suggestive of ischemia or ischemic changes, such as T wave inversions or a little bit of ST depression, they will automatically meet criteria as well for MI, also for a non STEMI. There's no ST elevation, but the patient meets criteria for the type 1 MI with a non STEMI. Okay. However, if there is a concern that the chest pain is non ischemic, what they recommend is that you first look at the history of coronary artery disease. If there's a history of coronary artery disease, you get the first set of troponins. Okay, yes, it's history of coronary artery disease. You get the first set of troponins. And the troponins are always positive at the 18 to 19 number, which means that the value is more than the 99th percentile. Whatever the val whenever the value is more than the 99th percentile, it means that the troponin is positive. And this is also the same definition that was initially set for myocardial infarction, myocardial injury. However, if the patient does not have any history of coronary artery disease, they suggest that you could use the HEAR score, which is a component of, a, of coronary artery disease, which is um, history, EKG, um, age, and risk factors. And if the score is high, there's a high chance that the patient will have coronary artery event. So the patient will have cardiac disease. And they suggest that you call cardiology for this and get a cardiovascular evaluation for the patient. Okay. Um, if the hair score is low over here, if the hair score is low and the troponin has been negative, there you know, those are the patients that they recommend early discharge. You can early discharge a patient from the emergency room and there's no need to observe the patients overnight. So someone asked, what is this 99th percentile? So this 99th percentile, for example, if you, if you measure multiple people, multiple patients, and let's say you have a thousand patients and you measure a thousand patients, and 99% of those patients will have a troponin less than 18. A troponin less than 18 means it's negative. So if your troponin is more than the 99th percentile, it means that the patient is having some type of myocardial injury. So it varies from assay to assay, but it averages around 17 to 19 for men and around 11 to 13 for women on most of the troponin assays. <clears throat> You know, this is another helpful flow chart. They evaluated 560 patients who went through a non-STEMI. And if you have a troponin at zero hours, zero hours, and the troponin is less than 12 at zero hours, which is negative, and there has been a change within one hour of less than three, those are the patients you can potentially rule out. Also, if at zero hours, the patient had a troponin less than five and no significant change within an hour, you can also rule them out. No significant change in the troponin within an hour. Then you can also rule them out. So the troponin change is less than five in an hour. You can also rule those patients out. So if an hour, if at hour zero, the patient had a troponin level less than five and no significant change within an hour apart, you can rule them out. However, if the patient had an initial troponin of more than 52 
and there was a change more than five. A change more than five is considered a significant rise. Those are the patients that are going to rule N. So if your first opponent is already 100, for example, those patients automatically rule in. There will always be exceptions, however. For example, we had a patient with a troponin of 7,000 and he had a normal cath. So this could have been another one of those secondary causes for the high troponin levels. Even if there's no rise and fall in a troponin in a patient, however, with a troponin of 50, for example, it is still considered positive and it is above the 99th percentile. So it's still considered positive. So in conclusion, so the high sensitivity troponin improves and accelerates the management of patients with suspected myocardial infarction. Uh, the increased sensitivity, however, reduces uh, troponin blind. So the troponin blind refers to that first six hours where we didn't know what was going on in, in the past. So for example, we would see a patient come in with a STEMI, come to the emergency room with a normal troponin. When we wait six hours to get the second one of the, you know, the old troponin type, now the second one is already a thousand. So it's already very, very high when we're waiting the six hours. So one of the benefits of the high sensitivity troponin is that you don't have that blind episode anymore. And, and you don't have that blind episode anymore because now we see the troponins one hour apart. And we should be doing those troponins one hour apart. You know, this is um, a more recent study published early this year. Again, the literature is very new. However, on this study, the 99th percentile was here. That's around 20. You know, this is 50. Um, this is around 20, maybe 20, 25. So they said that the healthy patients are the patients with the troponin around 5. So if you do have stable angina, if you do have heart failure, stable angina, heart failure, left ventricular hypertrophy, your troponins may be around 10. However, when it is higher than the 99th percentile, it means that the patient is having some sort of myocardial injury according to the recent definition. And if it is around 50, they could still be um, other causes. It could be hypertension, right? It could be hypertension. It could be heart failure. It could be a pulmonary embolus. It could be shock. However, it is considered positive because it is higher than the 99th percentile. So the odds of being an MI, the odds of being a myocardial infarction is going to be higher as the troponin goes higher. So a very large MI on a LAD STEMI, for example, the troponins will be about 10,000 nowadays. So a troponin of 1,000 is also very, very suggestive of an MI. Okay, very, very suggestive of an MI. However, it is very sensitive, and because of the high sensitivity, it loses a little bit of the specificity to the cardiac muscle. So you can still see, for example, a troponin of 1,000 related to heart failure or related to a PE, okay? So you can still see that there is need for uh, interpretation of that test. So this is going to be challenging for those patients. Um, cardiology is going to have to evaluate those patients more and do more procedures and tests. So someone asked a question, so what if we have a patient with a renal, with renal failure and they have high creatinine? So that could be a cause of uh, elevated troponins also, because you may see troponins around the level of 100 to 1,000 with kidney failure. So with kidney failure patients, your troponin levels could be right here between 100 and 1,000, okay? So the 1,000 may correlate roughly to a troponin of one in the pri prior troponin assays that we use, then we also saw a troponin of one in those times being related to other things as well, other causes. So a troponin of 10,000 today is very, very, it is very, very suggestive though of a large MI if you have a troponin level of 1,000. 
<clears throat> so this is how they concluded the specific the specific review. So they highlighted some of the benefits, which included early discharge. So it is going to help the ER. It loses its specificity as it increases the sensitivity. But they said that the, that the success of the implementation of this test is going to be based on a lot of things. So number one is first, the test should always be indicated. It should be ordered when there's a clear indication for it. It, could, it should not be just routinely ordered because um, if we do that, there'll be a lot of positives in patients who do not have coronary artery disease. So if it is positive and the patient has a strong likelihood, we should still use the other routine methods of diagnosis that we have, such as EKGs and stress tests to rule out the MI. Remember that a lot of other causes of um, other things cause troponin elevation that we spoke about um, earlier, and we spoke about most of them. So you can have plaque rupture, you can have um, any type of shock, um, any type of anemia, any type of uh, cardiac toxic um, medications as well, any kind of contusion on your heart, such as a person who had a motor vehicle accident, and there are other causes. Um, as well that includes sepsis, renal failure, heart failure, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, even stroke and hemorrhage can also cause troponin elevations. A lot of things can cause troponin elevations. So therefore, this is just another flow chart that was developed, but this is what they have suggested. So for example, if the patient comes to the emergency room and he's been having chest pain more than six hours, and we do three or four sets of troponins and they're all normal, the patient can be discharged, okay? So we talked about this already. If the patient has a change every hour of approximately more than four or five of the troponin level, those are the patients that are in that gray zone. Those are the patients that have the recommendation to observe them overnight and get cardiology evaluation. So they may or may not be having a heart attack if the troponin level only changed around four or five. If the patient has a troponin of more than 100, however, they go and, you know, when they first come into the emergency room, they are already recommended to admit that patient and get a cardiac evaluation, okay? So the patients that have a troponin of greater than 100. So with a troponin of more than 100 with this study, there is a specificity of around 99% that there is 90% that the test is truly positive and there's a high likelihood that this patient has an MI. So the challenge is when the patients are in that gray zone and in the in-between zone and then it's not very positive, the troponins let's say are 30 to 40, those are the patients that we need to get cardiology on board, maybe do some additional testing, get a CT or a stress test. Um, and figure out what's going on. Another study, um, another review article shows that with most of the troponin assays, the cutoff is around 10 for women and 15 for men. If there's a change less than four, if there's a change less than four, it is considered not significant, but anything more than four within an hour apart is considered significant. So strongly consider MI if the patient um, troponin values from the get-go is more than 100, which we talked about in the prior slide, or if there is a change more than 10, two hours apart. So if a change of five and then a change of five. So there's a change of 10 more than two hours apart. We should avoid doing repeat troponins every six hours. The ICU nurses are the ones that can really play a major role in not having this happen. The patterns may be difficult to see in those patients who arrive late in the ER. So it's important to make sure we're not doing serial troponins every six hours anymore, that, but we're doing those troponins every hour. So in summary, the benefits of using the high sensitivity uh, troponin, it will provide a more robust and sensitive analytic data for the clinician. So the identification of patients that can have an early discharge will be much easier and can be facilitated the rule in for MI is now more rapid. There's no need to wait. If the troponin is more than 100, the patient is automatically 
ruled in. Any high sensitivity troponin level more than 100, absolutely, patient is ruled in. So the success um, of the implementation of this test will be based on having enough education and how to maximize the um, advantages of every test and minimize the disadvantages. Also, success should be focused on appropriate ordering. Um, any delta, any change in variation more than five an hour apart is considered significant. So we should still use the same risk assessment also. Scores, the risk scores that we always use before, such as the TME and the Frisk, etc. Okay. Um, a lot of the success also will be based on the cooperation of a lot of things, such as collaboration of cardiology with the emergency room, for example. Uh, at the end of the lecture, someone also asked a question, what is the current turnaround time for troponins from the lab? So what we have seen is that it's not very high and it's been running around 30 to 40 minutes. The maximum is usually 40 to 50 minutes or so. Sometimes Dr. Albuquerque says that when he gets a call from the ER about a patient and, and he arrives and the team has shown up to the hospital and the calf team is already there, they already have that troponin level. So worst case scenario, you should be getting that troponin level in less than an hour. So this concludes the lecture that was given by Dr. Albuquerque. I hope it has been helpful to you. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to come to Dr. Albuquerque or share your questions with me, Simone, or with Tracy, and we will find the answers for you. Thank you for taking the time to review this and learning more about the high sensitivity troponins.